this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles, and I want to welcome you to another episode of Stories of the Supernatural. Wherever you find us, whether it's a video or podcast on your favorite platform, please like and subscribe to us so that you can get notification of when a new show is released. You can also find us on major social media platforms. If you go to MiamiGhostChronicles.com, you can find links to the videos or MP3 files, which you can download and enjoy without commercial interruptions. If you're into classic horror, ghost, and adventure stories, I narrate Nightshade Diary, and you can find links at NightshadeDiary.com. If scary stories are your bag, and listening to encounters with cryptids, ghosts, dogmen, and other weird creatures sends a shiver up your spine, then go to SupernaturalStoryTime.com for links to our weekly podcasts. Noteworthy news about the paranormal world, true crime, conspiracy stories, and anything that is just plain weird can be found at eerie.news or visit the Stranger Than Fiction Stories tab at MiamiGhostChronicles.com. Please subscribe to my newsletter on Substack. Just go to mppelliser.com for a link. I want to thank you for being part of my audience, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi, everybody. How's everybody doing? Good, I hope. I'll comment on what I usually comment, which is the weather, because it's hot. And I'm a Florida girl, okay? And I come from South Florida, which is subtropical. It's hot. You know, of course, I've gone through this heat before, some version of it. But, you know, there's nothing like when you're there to make it feel like it's really hot. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we went through a spate there of a lot of thunderstorms. And then it's, it's just really hot. As in, I'm like I said, I'm a wither wimp. I go out there early in the morning and... Like around now, like around 7 p.m. to do anything. It took me like three days to, I mean, I have acreage, but to, uh, I'm the lawnmower lady, by the way, in the, in the household. And it took me like three days to cut the lawn out here just because I had to split it up. Like, I'm not doing this in the middle of the day. There is no way. And I'm pretty brave about that. Uh, but no, it was just no, unless I want to get a heat stroke, I've got to, I've got to cut this up. So yeah, something that normally will take me one full day if I get up early in the morning to, most two, I had to split up into three days. And um, yeah, that's, I'm keeping all my animals. As a matter of fact, I usually have a big porch where I leave my dogs out. Usually when I'm away, like like I in the middle of the day. And even there, even though I have fans there, it's a screen porch. And I've had to drag them inside because I'm like, I cannot leave you guys out here. It's just too hot, too hot. But again, you know, and then it'll, then it'll be winter and we'll be like, man, it's so cold. It'll be like, shh. Nothing, nothing to see here, folks. But anyway, um, let's get on to the good part. The good part is who we have as a guest today at Stories of the Supernatural. And this is the first time that this gentleman has been here. His name is David Collis. And he is an artist, an author, and who characterizes his life as a quest driven by the romance of exploration and invention. He is versed in the humanities, art, and religion, and holds a bachelor and oh, I got kind of a bachelor's and a master's degree in fine art. And I'm going to quote him here on his biography. My life was an unplanned walkabout that didn't unfold as expected. I wanted one thing, but received another. Questions shaped it instead. Revelations inspired it. Awakenings expanded it. Curiosity fueled it. I traveled the world, explored sacred places, and searched religious and mystical traditions. The intelligence of my hands built houses, furniture, cabinets, and coupled with my artistic personality, created abstract art. The motto required is, life is remarkable, be ready for surprises, and nimble for the unexpected. That's an understatement. Help me welcome him. How are you doing today, David? I'm doing great. I just want to mention something about your Miami heat over there. Yes. I've been in Miami uh -huh. right before the 4th of July. It was 100 degrees with 100% humidity, and it was yes. raining cats and dogs. I've yes. never been so miserable in my life. Yes. And I've gotten so, used to that. That's why I'm saying it's, I, I'm used to difficult weather. Yes. Because where I moved like a couple of years ago, I'm up in North Florida now, but you know, anything South of like West, of West Palm beach, you go into subtropical climate, which is like you said, the humidity, that sticky heat kind of deal. And I grew up in that. That was the norm. And I'm just being a wimp because it's hot and up here, the, there's still humidity, but it's not, it's not the subtropical thing going on. Uh -huh. But I'm saying, you know, every, you know, when you're living in that present moment, it's like, this is the worst. <laughs> and it's like, okay. 
a friend of mine's telling me that the ocean temperature is getting really hot too. Right. I was hearing that the Atlantic, that the surface temperatures have never been as hot, but the flip side of that is, and having grown up, I was born and raised in Miami is that around this, is we're, we're right in the middle of hurricane season. And usually by now, even if we wouldn't have had any hurricanes come into like the coast, there's none have developed. Believe it or not, it's really weird, which is great, by the way. There's one of those that's one of the things that when you lived in South Florida between uh -huh. May and uh and November, late November, which was hurricane season, you always were looking at the weather like what's forming off the coast of Africa and will end up, you know, coming into the Caribbean and uh, you know, into where we're at. Yeah, no you storms, have to. You no have hurricanes. To. Even though a lot of people will say, Well, wait until September and October, because lately some years we've had those like almost late summer storms, but still. So hot Atlantic, but no storms, no hurricanes. And well, for we've people had who a, have, a don't live in a coastal experience. I was going to say we have a very freaky experience out there in Hawaii with that hurricane. Oh my God. Wait, that's what I was looking at. I was looking at, and I was like, wait, how did this go from zero to 60? How did they, how did yeah. this blaze get so out of control so quick? I mean, people are jumping and into the water. Sudden, like, got, like, it's just outrageous. I was looking at because when I heard the news, it was like, okay, Hurricane Dora, and then fires. I was like, whoa, 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 how, how did how do we go from hurricane and fires? How did that happen? Right. I was like, I don't understand this. And then I realized, okay, these apparently the winds from the hurricane that didn't do a direct strike helped to fan this fire to like spreading. Hmm. And like the way it did of... rapidly, but I'm like, okay, but how did this thing start? Yeah. Was it a lightning strike? I don't know. Were they right. going through a dry period? And, right. and you know what I have, um, I've had trees come down like huge trees and I've had big bonfires and I burn a lot of stuff here because I have no choice. I do understand very well that if you've got a wind going on, that fire will take off in yeah. minutes. It's yeah. going. Yeah. That part I understand really well. But it was like, wait, how did we go from? And I mean, I looked at the scene where the cars, everything's melted. And I don't know. The last time I saw there was about 36 people that had died. And it was like. That's a huge number. That is. And it's like, uh, from what I understand, people were, the residents there were caught by surprise, in other words, is what I'm yeah. saying. That they didn't expect that that was going to happen. Like they basically had to flee, you know, that with the uh, clothes on our back kind of thing. Yeah. And then actually go into the ocean to save themselves. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Wow. See, uh, I've been at that harbor in Lahaina. I've been at that harbor. I've yeah. seen the photo and it's just like, it's totally devastated. I've been at that harbor on numerous occasions. So and, I, it, I, and I've never, totally you know, you hear about the fires like up in like the, you know, California and Colorado and things like that. But I've never heard of a fire like that in Hawaii of all places. I've never heard of, of that. Of course. I was stunned. What do you mean fire? Yeah. They were yeah. talking about fires. What do you mean fire? It's tropical. Exactly. That's I mean, what I thought. I said a fire, a fire. <laughs> they're on the equator. It's wet. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And I was like, no. And then they're throwing the hurricane thing in there. I was like, I don't, I missed the connection, but. But yeah, they're saying, let's see what comes of it. I mean, I imagine now they can't do much of an investigation until they actually, I think they put that fire out because. So it's still going. The last I looked. Yeah. Basically, it looked like their, and I don't blame them, like their fire department was, ta they were maxed out, like trying to put this, get this thing under control. Um, and how do you, how do you call for help? Oh, can you people from the West Coast just bring over your. That's another Fire thing. Engines? When you're not on the mainland, you've got to, you've got whatever is there, especially when it's, we're talking an emergency. Yeah. It's like whatever is there, you better hurt, get it over there quick. Yeah. I get, don't those, know. get those Navy ships out there and start put, pumping some water out. That's what I thought. There. I said, well, I, you know, I'm not that, I don't know how close the Navy base is to where this is at, but it was like, okay, I hope that the Navy is sending some help or something. But it's let's see, just, let's see what, what comes of this when the dust settles. So yeah, what they say, how this got started and, you know, what happened and how did this get so out of control? And I bet you they're going to have to make up new rules from now on. It's like, I don't know. 
you know, the, the, it, like in Florida, you know, we have hack, hurricane evacuation routes, some way to get people out of there besides jumping into the ocean. Right. <laughs> you know, let me well, ask you, David, in your, in your, um, in your bio, which I thought was great. You mentioned that your life, I mean, and I know that your life didn't unfold as expected, which I, for most people, most people will say that that's, but in your case, what did you mean by that? Well, I felt like I wanted to do one thing and then another thing happened. So I was, uh, I, I wanted to become a pilot and that, okay. that didn't happen. So the, a lot of other things started to unfold kind of in the negative. And um, from that, there were questions and the questions that I started to ask were what started to drive kind of my life. And that I think is a really kind of a key and interesting issue. And that is for me, and I think that this is also kind of a truism is that once you start asking questions and you really are devoted to understanding the answer to the question, your life starts to take on a new direction. So I ended up wanting to know more about religion, uh, myself, psychology, art history, all of these kind of ideas. And I just, I never was kind of interested in those things. Well, art I've been interested in, but um, when it came to like art history and psychology uh, and religion, those weren't like part of my uh, lexicon. And then right. I had an event that uh, was really kind of, it just shook me to the core and that just put me on this course to start really investigating um, these questions. And uh, lo and behold, that has been what I keep doing. So the question is, is uh, how do you build a house? How do you build furniture? How do you build, you know, how do you deal with wood? What's all that? What are tools? How do you work with tools? All of those things just started to come to me because I kept asking questions. And the other one was, you know, like, who is God and what are our religious traditions? You know, so they're always in the background. But until you actually start to do an, an investigation into them, they seem to always just sit on the shelf somewhere else. Sure. And they're like part of your the furniture, right? Right, right. <laughs> well, well, you know what? Family is just part of the furniture. It's part of your life. But Nowadays, I felt like I needed more than there that. is so much out there. And I hate to say it, but sometimes you have to be careful when you're looking at something to look at it objectively. But at the same time, you know. Sometimes people that, that when they write about things, they, they don't source them well or uh, the information that's given is not accurate. So especially when you're getting into something like religion or spirituality. Um, how can I say what's the word I'm thinking of that you try to be as objective as possible? Yeah. Without coloring it one way or the other, depending. I don't know what your background is or your belief system. Um. Or preconceived ideas. How's that? Yeah. When it comes to spirituality. Well, you know, the other thing that's happened to me is because I went down this road and I started to really think through it, uh, I then started to arrive at some different conclusion and different uh, understandings and with new questions. So a question, you know, propels you down. You do a lot of investigation, a lot of research, and then all of a sudden that opens up into a whole new field. And now you're in a different territory with a whole new set of questions with the same kind of drive. So, uh, right. That you wouldn't have ended up there if you hadn't gone down that's correct. Open this door to at the end, then the other one, that's and then correct. you go through there. So you have to go that's through correct. a process. And it's almost so it like there's like several almost like a lifelong thing. It is. And, and it keeps on happening. That's the thing. It just keeps happening. So whenever I said, okay, I'm just going to kick back and, you know, relax now. I've kind of got what I need, nah. needed. No, now there's a whole no. new thing to go after. So did you ever come across anything? And when you were learning that you went, that was unexpected. Like what, what something that really yeah. caught you by surprise? <laughs> well, let's just say almost all of it. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, so you know, history so a lot of this had to deal with uh, history, and then it had sure. to deal with traveling, and then it had to deal with the exploration of religions. And of course, we're coming from um, my frame of time was, you know, a baby boomer, mm -hmm. post-World War II, you know, the American um, economy was thriving. We landed a man on the moon, all, you know, the Cold War, all of that. So there was a, a great deal of 
concern and effort into one making a living, one doing, you know, something pretty amazing with your life and then, you know, living the American dream. Sure. And all of that stuff started to change for me around 20 or thereabouts, even a little bit before, and which I started to think about things a little differently than uh, the kind of my society issues and my kind of family issues and how to okay. how to look outside of that envelope. Right, so, because uh, most people have, what, um, how can I tell you, family expectations, you know, that's it's, right. It's, it, societal expectations, depending on, you know, what circumstances you grew up in. That's exactly, and, you know, and yeah. I grew up in, I grew up in Southern California at the beach and there was a, you know, and I, I did a lot of surfing. Right. So that was a very interesting kind of cultural experience sure. to have. And it was a very kind of happy, free and easy kind of a, a experience. Mm -hmm. And now, um, things are a little bit different for me. Um, I still, I kind of cherish all those ideas and I cherish what I experienced, but I ended up having to kind of go down a different road and, and have uh, different experiences. You know, again, I go back to the questions, the questions keep coming. And I, once I started to read Plato and started to recognize the Greek influence on kind of my life about the nature of the question, how a question is formed and the pursuit of trying to find the answer to the question. That's when I went, ah, that that's, that's kind of who I am at this point. And then that Let got coupled you, when, in with, when you got into this, when you started reading, you know, all these, well, you know, you go into these different schools of philosophy or like you said, either Plato or Socrates or, you know, all these different, how can I say, I don't want to say, well, either be the belief systems or way that they interpreted life or the way it should be. Was this something, because I'm thinking, I'm, I'm thinking exactly what you said. Here you are, you're a surfer in Southern California. All right. And the beaches, you know, you have this, I'm sorry, I'm going to say it. You have a stereotype of the surfer guy. All right. And then you turn and you're telling me, I said, I shifted away from that and went into studying. Um, it sounds like giving things deep thought because I can't imagine yeah. anybody reading Plato because I have That's nothing correct. better to do. You know? That's correct. That's correct. In fact, my, my library. So let's just say, you know, before 19, I had a lot, you know, my books, the amount of books that I had probably were like a couple of dozen. I now have essentially two libraries. Wow. Huge. Wow. So books now became one of the emphasis of, uh, of my life. So Let me and, ask and you, the this... reading of it and the pursuit of it. I'm going to say when you did it originally, was it for an intellectual pursuit or was it a spiritual pursuit or both? I, I think um, for one, it was trying to answer um, a fundamental question. And that is, you know, why are we here? And then the okay. other one was, who am I? So I felt that there was a, a level of wisdom that I could um, explore that my my upbringing didn't provide. Okay. So, so in other yeah. words, you went into, and I know a lot of people will do this. They'll go into what they think is just, I'm just going to do this for intellectual purposes. And then along the way, the spirituality creeps in, if you want to look at it that way. That's correct. Uh not because they were looking at it, because it's almost like you said, you know, be like, oh, you know, you're getting all soft. No, I'm just studying this stuff because you want to see what these guys were doing back in uh, in Greece in those times. When, um, and it's not just Greece that I'm interested in. What, what's it's that the, whole Mediterranean, Asia okay. Minor, Egypt, up there okay. in um, uh, England. Yeah, there's quite a bit of information that I was interested in. Well, there was uh, so much, you know, whether, I mean, you think of the Romans and the, uh, you know, conquest of Rome throughout all of Europe and the Mediterranean. I mean, there was so much going on, whether it was, you know, BC or AD. That's correct. You know, they had, you had your historians, you know, the ones that were, and the philosophers and things of that nature. And some of the stuff you read it and you have to like, I got to really read this like three times because I don't get it. You know, the way that. Yes. <laughs> yes. I totally understand what you're saying. It's yeah. like there was another world over there in which intelligence and education was, uh, well, at least education for certain people was very, very important. And of course, so the people doing... that are writing are the ones that are the um, 
the privileged, so to speak. Well, they're finding even now, um, archaeology wise, that a lot of these stories that some of these historians were talking about ancient cities or ancient civilizations, which sometimes they were thought were not for real. They're discovering some of these cities or some of these locations that these historians were describing were did actually exist. Yes. And guess um, what? There's also what? others that are down at the bottom of the ocean, about 300 feet or more. Okay. What are we talking so, like along what around in the uh, in inside the Mediterranean or off the coast yeah. of? Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and a, a number of other places. So right, um, I know that there's hit. the like the other day they uh, came up they found um, a ship right off the coast of Sardinia. All right, it's in the waters of Sardinia, and it's as a matter of fact, it's got those um, those wine canisters that you see from Roman times. Yeah totally intact in there all right and they say there's they believe that there's and it's the the water's not really that that deep where they found it that they say they believe there's a bunch of other ships like that in that area um that and, and the, the truth is you never think of the mediterranean as being so rough that ships would sink right but yeah there's a, a lot of things that um uh, as far as archaeology is concerned um that yeah, I'm sure that there is as far as uh things waiting to be discovered. What do you um was there any time how can I say was there any time period that you found more fascinating than the other or something that you read? And and I'm gonna the reason why I say this is there's a version of history that's put out, and I'm gonna say generalized history. I'm not gonna talk about something that's in depth. But then when you really start to study it or you start to read about it, you're like, wait a minute, this is not what I thought it was. This is this is not history as what everybody thinks about either this time period or this location or this civilization. Yes. Did you come that across something all the time. like that? Like what? That happens all the time, which makes me start to question, you know, what it is that our education. Oh, here we go. I love it. Teaching us, <laughs> right. Yes. So what is our true past? So and sure. what can we know from our true past? Yes. And is it is it necessary to understand our true past yes. versus the past that has been told to us that might have a lot of misinformation and inaccuracies to it? Sure. So and I think that's a problem because what was it to the victor go the spoils? And I don't know if I'm quoting this, but I think part of it is the ability to write history the way you want you want the history to play out. You know, you I don't know if you've heard about how when uh, this was around the uh, Renaissance and all these other time periods when these um, patrons would have their paintings done, their portraits. Yeah. But these masters were told like, hey, make me look good. <laughs> you yep. know, take off that double chin and, you know, yep. the wrinkles, you know, stuff yep. like that. And I think that a lot of times uh, history, they've done the same thing with history a lot more than just, let's say, taking off a few wrinkles as far as exactly what happened or who did what or what was the. And then after a while, the, everybody that could have said it, it didn't happen that way dies. And there you go. Then you have that version. And then you have the people trying to understand what happened before and then writing about it. So I think part of our old epic stories uh, still contain an element of history to it. And it's kind of mm -hmm. fascinating to read what they were talking about. Okay. Um, and because you start seeing what was important. So I've learned to, and this is kind of fascinating because this is kind of goes back to it. Like, is there anything that you've actually found? And yeah, I mean, there's all this in, new information that I found, but there's also the way in which something is shaped. Okay. That is actually more interesting to me is, you know, why would um, this particular thing be shaped this way? And since I wrote a book called Interviewing Jesus, the Man, yes. most of the um, material that I was interested in was trying to understand the historical context. So, okay. uh, but, you know, when I wrote it, I finally realized, hey, you know what, I better start putting something down on paper from all the things that I've researched. So I researched okay. a great deal of history, Greek history, Roman history, Egyptian history, Hebrew history, uh, the religions of those areas. And, um, you know, I'm not a very good linguist, so I didn't get into the language of it. And I haven't read anything from original sources because mm -hmm. I'm just, I, I just don't have that ability. So I have right. to rely on what other people are, are um, 
on the translation. For me. So, but there are, you know, you finally start looking at big, big pictures and you start seeing what was important and what isn't important. Uh, then I started reading a, the anthologies of all the, the kind of the spiritual literature. So I have you know, the Nag Hammadi library and I have the Dead Sea Scrolls and I have the Apocrypha and, and uh, other books that are, you know, the forbidden books of the Bible and, and, and things like that. And again, you get a different point of view because these people now are, we have the writing. So at least whether it's a full account of all the writings, but you have an account of a great deal of writing. And from that, you can start gleaming new information. So right. imagine um, if there's also a consensus among these different sources. Or there might be that, okay, these ideas no longer are suitable for the way in which the culture wants to embrace this information. And this becomes heretical. And Christianity is very good at that. Oh, yeah. Which yes. makes me believe that maybe the theology um, has been manufactured, so to speak. Sure. Um, and it is different than what Jesus was presenting. I, I believe. And, and, you know, and this is, the, how's this? I suspect it, but without doing the firsthand research like what you've done, I'm hesitant to say one way or the other, but I, that I do believe it. Yes, I do believe it because um, they, the, the, the feeling I got as far as the, the early Catholic church, I'm going to even later on was. Are you Catholic? The, yes, I am. You are. Okay. No. This is fascinating. Yes. There you go. And um that you could tell that there um uh, any everything uh, the divinity of had as far as Jesus or anything having to do with Jesus, whether it was his the apostles, his background, we're talking about the Virgin Mary having to be a virgin, all that, whether it's true or not, I'm I'm not saying, but you could tell that. The belief systems, once it became an organized religion, and they, I think like all religions, even before Catholicism, you know, it's it's power. You know, you have to like make your 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 followers believe in something. And yeah, I, I do have a feeling that Jesus' original message somewhere along the way, it got either corrupted or changed or there was stuff, if not lied about, omitted. How's that? And I'm being nice. Yes. You know. uh, that I totally agree with it. When I read, um, when I really started to look at all of one of the things, well, let me just go back. So what I did is I took all of his sayings and I said, okay, I, there is the, um, a group called the Jesus seminar and mm -hmm. they set out to kind of look at all of the sayings of Jesus and they catalyze them, catalog them, um, by giving them a color code. So they went, okay, red is the most likely thing he said. Pink is most is just below most likely. He probably said this. Gray, eh, maybe not. Black, absolutely not. He didn't say this. So I decided, okay, I'm going to take all of those reds and pinks and put them down on a paper on paper. Okay, 25 pages. 25 right. pages of his things. Okay. That's a the, lot. And then okay. they and they color coded it red or pink. Okay. Right. So I'm just using it. These are things that he said, or most likely he said, okay. okay. So now I break it down into other subgroups. So, um, he talks a lot about money. Okay. How about, how about food? Yeah. Okay. How about kingdom of heaven? Oh, kingdom of heaven. These are all very fascinating. Oh, he has 22 sayings of the kingdom of heaven and there are nine, I think there's, there's 10 themes, 10 okay. themes of the kingdom of heaven. Not one of them mentions sin, salvation, and you're going to hell. Not one. Right. Right? Okay. Yes. But he is being presented as somebody who is going to essentially send you to hell. What? Yeah. What? Think about that. Yes. There's no sin, no salvation, no going to hell in any of those sayings, which are his most right. potent of all of his sayings when it comes to what he says the kingdom of God is like. Kingdom of heaven or kingdom of God. Right. So you have the mustard seed. Ah, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is a, like a strong man. This kingdom of heaven is, um, you know, like leaven. There are, this is not about sin. No, it's not. It's not. 
It's, it's about process. Yes. Isn't that fascinating? Yes, it is. But so be like the king. Okay, the, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. What happens? Well, when you plant it, it become it grows and becomes a place for you know the birds to live in. What does that tell you? Right. Exactly. So, anyway, there is that no, me- there is no um I know what you're saying there as far as the that that loop and let's face it, well, in Christianity, I don't know, that looming thing that you know, if you don't, you're gonna end up in a hot place, you know. Right. Okay. So this is really fascinating. Why would it change? Because you were saying power. So yes, what is course. it that they're doing for one power and two disempowerment? Yes. So well, the question is, is why are you being disempowered? Jesus said, you're going to be able to do it. If I, everything that I do, you can do too, if not better. Because that, that, right. That, so he's not going saying, hey, now worship me. He never said that. Bow right. down to me. Don't work. He doesn't say that. Some mm-hmm. other people put words in his mouth that said that, but he's not here to be worshiped. That's idolatry. Right. Anyway. But, so, the, but the thing is this, that people don't realize that even before that, religions up to that time, that, that was the norm. Whatever your God was or gods, you know, whether monotheistic or pantheon or whatever. That thing of their the God, and you had a priest, you know, priesthood or, or some type of temple. So I think that for Jesus to say something like that was like totally out of the norm of the way spirituality was handled during those times. Well, because, definitely for um, his his Hebrew culture, it was yeah because the uh, the high priests and the priests had uh, a great deal of power. Yes. In their yes. society. And so when he was saying the kingdom of heaven is inside of you, that immediately um, threw out the, the temple. Of course. Right? So if the kingdom of heaven is inside of you, why do I need to go over to that temple? That's a big There you go. Let me you, that's a big problem. Let me tell you. There you go. For a lot. <laughs> Holy that's cow. A big Wait a minute. Yes. Yes. So what's going on here? So that what's going on is that there seems to be another um, concept in which one group gets power and another group is disempowered. Right. Okay. So the level of disempowerment is something that we need to really pay attention to. So how do you go about and re-empowering yourself? Well, for one thing, you need to sacrifice your own God that you think is a God, when in reality, it's not. It's an idol. So um, that's where I am. Well, no. The, you have to the... kind of go through and, and get rid of all of that and just say, these are power mechanisms to keep sure. me from understanding, one, who I am. So if we go back and we say, um, you know, God... The Old Testament says, I am that I am. What about me? Because my spirit, my soul is in complete congruence with the energy of the divine. Yes. And if that is the case, then I should be doing everything that I can to make sure that I am who I am. Well, it, not I don't want to say I, that not, the, I'm going to use the example of the Catholic Church because that's what I'm everything a lot of what's in catholicism is the intercession the intercession yes. of the priest the intercession of a saint the intercession of the virgin mary I, which but in other words there's always that um that you need like a like a you know a go a go between yes to uh, access like you said divinity you know? yeah when you when a person, I want to say a human being, is put in that position, that's when you get the fear of you you either do whatever you need to appease or escape punishment or, you know, when ask people, because you're thinking that I don't have that ability to connect with the divine directly. I have to go through somebody else. That's right. And hopefully, hopefully they'll put in a good word for me, <laughs> you know, the hookup. That's right. And so once you finally, this is the other thing that happened with me is so I kind of had an epiphany uh, when I was reading the Gospel of Thomas. Right. And in it, I I was like, there's no one to go to. (laughs) (laughs) At the end of all of this stuff, there is no God you go to that's like, 
you know, the, the person behind the curtain. There right. is no one there. What is there, though? Right. And so now you start having to go down a different road as to what is the nature of matter? What is the nature of energy? What is the nature of consciousness? How do all of those concepts and realities actually interweave with each other? So, and I think do that. Do you think that, um, for obvious reasons, do you think that Jesus's humanity was put on a back burner because they had to make him more, look more divine? Yes. Um, yeah. Because. You can't be a, you know, the son of God and be that human. How's that? <laughs> be quiet, Jinjin. That's correct. So, and of course, who was supposed to be the the God at that time was Caesar. And the son of God was his son. Mm -hmm. And so now Christianity has to go along with this other alternate parallel universe. Let me ask, do you think, what, what, what do you think, looking at back at what you researched, what do you think was the attraction for early Christians, all right? That there was actually a divine, um, this is very important. Okay, so everybody felt that the gods and fate and destiny were already written and that you really couldn't have any type of experience with them without some type of contract, okay? So Jesus comes along and says, there's no contract, you're it. Right. Okay, so what he was showing and what he did and what I am totally convinced was going on is that there was this floodgate that opened on a mystical level that connected all these people to each other and to the divine in a way that they hadn't experienced before. Right. And that was what was so important and so powerful. However, yes. you can't have all those people having these kind of in individual experiences undermining essentially the Roman Empire. Because yes. that's what it was. So Rome, <laughs> funny thing is, is Rome, this is really interesting. Rome said every person every day has to make some motion, some thought, some sacrifice, some money, something you have to give to Caesar every day. And the Jews mm -hmm. at the temple were sacrificing every single day to caesar did you know that i didn't know that yeah okay. i didn't know that so the the pious jews were saying hey this is a sacri this is a sacrilege you can't be making these types of sacrifices to rome every day but they you know i i, I always thought to, do that. to be perfectly honest I, you know i always thought of the romans as being very tolerant of the religions of the lands they conquered and they were all they cared is if you pay your taxes, that's correct, and you let them run the show. That's, that's correct, it. that's it. But you're telling me here they that want they want peace, they wanted to know everything that there was in their empire, okay. And then this was something new, okay. Okay, so I now they're going, now wait a minute, what is this thing? Right. And how come these people are worshiping not Caesar? But they're looking towards someone else. Well, wait a second. You know, they started shaking their hand going, wait, we don't know what this is. And we don't know if we want this. Okay. So eventually in the second century is when things kind of really started to turn south or bad for the Christians. I mean, obviously in the middle of the, like the 60, in the 60s, uh, there were the persecutions in Rome. But when you look at the size of the Roman Empire, it wasn't a, it wasn't like a purge like you see with the Nazis uh, with right. the Jews in the 30s and the 40s. There was none of that right. at that time. But there were times when they went, okay, this, this religion is actually not a religion at all because they won't participate in any of the festivals. They've rejected That's, all okay, because of the I was festivals. thinking, you know what? No. I would think these early Christians would probably be so disorganized that who was paying attention to them? However... Uh, I could see that if they weren't participating, somebody would notice it. Like, oh, we're You're having not the festival of Lupercalia, whatever. Ugh. So you kind of were talking about like religion was about power and all that. It, actually, yes. I think there were other elements to that. And one of the elements, and this is a very important part, um, you know, when you uh, have decided to participate in say the passion of Jesus and you go through the stages of the cross. Yes. That event is a 
mystical connection to this particular passion. It is a mystery play. You are participating in a mystery. And by participating in a mystery, you yourself are Im embedding that in your mind and in the reality of the space. Okay, so it's you and your culture. You're doing something like that. When you go back and you look at what the Egyptians were doing, they were playing out mystery plays, mystery ideas that were associated with the with the zodiac and the motion of the stars. And they knew that there had to be a level of order for everything to work properly and for everybody to kind of be part of this big thing called Egypt in which we were all working towards the building of this great empire and this great place and this great idea. And uh, we are all blessed because of the Nile. Right. So why would they be thinking that way? Well, because there was a huge cataclysm, not just one or two or three, but multiple cataclysms that uh, started in the year around uh, 11,800. And it just kept on going all the way through to the middle of the uh, second century BC or second millennium BC. I wasn't aware of that. You know, you so always think of the um... flood, that flood, it existed, but it was only one part. But that okay. was at the tail end of a disaster. So okay. there were all these catastrophes that were taking place, and there was absolutely no order at all. So, right. and, and I understand that part of the thing is that you're hoping that by doing something, the God or gods or whatever is like, is what else have you got left? Because back then they didn't have the technology to understand weather patterns or earthquakes or correct. whatever the case so yeah. we're starting to see calendars with all those stone circles starting in the year like 10,000 BC or 9,000 BC. Mm -hmm. Why? Because they all of a sudden there were seasons. Yes. This is bizarre. We had mild seasons before that. If you go back and you read all. It was like in other words, something that was out of the norm is what you're talking about. Seasons. All of a sudden, there's a season. What happened? Well, the earth tilted 23.5 degrees. What happened at that point? <laughs> Disasters. How long did, on, on, did that tilt take? What, when, what span of time are we talking about? It, it could have happened over the course of um, a couple of centuries or uh, millenniums. Okay. You know, it went from zero, right? Straight up and down. Right, right. To, straight up. Right? That way. Exactly. So, what was happening? So if, if something's straight up, I've been trying to wonder through... Think about that. If something is straight up, if the earth is at, uh, straight up and it's spinning this way, mm -hmm. um, everything that you look up in the sky is just going to go around in a circle. Sure. Right? But if it's tilted, that means that one part of the sky is going to be arced. It's going to move in a different direction. Okay. So it's going to be coming down. It's going to go through its whole big cycle from one place on the horizon to another place on the horizon. My feeling exactly. is, is that it probably went up and down. Like the sun might have just kind of always went up and always went down, I would say, within a very narrow space, right? right. Whereas if you look out now on the horizon, you know, where summer solstice is, it's way the heck over there. And then in the winter solstice, it's way over there, right? Yeah, exactly. I don't. Exactly. It wasn't like that before. Things were much more stable. So, right, anyway. exactly. I, I would think that with your axis being up like this, your seasons are very, how can I say it? Depending, of course, where you lived in the yeah. earth. It was very, all the, all the time, it was mostly the same thing. No, yes. no surprises. It wasn't, and it wasn't like as drastic as what we were seeing. Yes. So there was, all of a sudden, there was this drastic elements. Like, how come there's all of this snow all the way down in Iran, to present day Iran? Where all these water, all this water just showed up. Literally, there's three, four hundred feet of water that used to not be there. Now it is. So now everything's submerged and it's all been washed away. Uh, I mean, the, the disasters were, you know, are quite remarkable of what happened. So um, anyway, and what do you think? These civilizations, they all interpreted it, or they all had to. Okay, well, the, here's the thing: they all had to figure out mm -hmm. how because they were pretty much hunting and gatherers, how are yes. they going to survive now with all these seasons and how are we going to cultivate food? 
Right. So the domestication of animals and the beginning of agriculture occurred right around that, um, around uh, 10,000 BC or, or a little bit before. Right. Which is when you start seeing all these cities being. That's right. So now we have civilization. Ability. And and so what do we see with these civilizations? Someone, someone, <laughs> I don't know who, but someone was showing them how to build a civilization and become and, and start cultivating the land for food. Yes. It wasn't part of them, but somebody all, whether they were gods or other beings, or other humans from right. other places, were showing people how to do things that they sure. didn't know how to do before. Yeah, I think we were, like you said, whether, depending again where you were at, either you followed herds around, if you were a hunter-gatherer, yeah, if you lived by the sea, but you ate, you know, what the sea provided. Yeah, <clears throat> but very simple, very simple life. Then all of a sudden everything changed. So that was one thing. So the reason why that was fascinating to me is, um, you know, when you when you get into Christianity, you get, you get to the very end of the Bible. It's like, okay, so you start off in Genesis and then you move mm -hmm. all the way through all that long stuff. And then Jesus shows up and then you go through uh, this period and then you read the um, last book in, of the Bible, which is the book of Revelation. It's like, okay, what's going on here? Okay. You start reading all those things and you're going, where did they come up with those ideas? And when Jesus is supposed to have been saying all these things about the end times, where where is all this? Where did all this come from? Is it just from his imagination? Is it because he was God and he knew what was happening? What? So that has always been in the back of my mind. Where did all that come from? Well, now I'm starting to realize that there were versions. There were things that happened that are part of the collective memory. Okay. In that whole region, whether you're in uh, like the area of Turkey now, the Eastern Mediterranean, Egypt, all the way out um, to Spain and beyond, all kinds of that whole region of the Mediterranean region all have horror stories to tell you about what happened on a climatic basis, how the weather changed, how the earth changed, how the animals were killed. How the yes. sun, how all this fire hit the earth. Yes. Okay. So you're seeing little remnants of this catastrophe, of these catastrophes, because there were many. One mm -hmm. of them started with, you know, in the, you will see one, not the only one, but you will see one in um, the book of Exodus where the Jews are leaving Egypt. And what happened? There were all these plagues. There was all this things that were happening. Well, when you go back and you start looking at the archaeological and then you start looking at the geological records, those things that happened were what was going on at an earlier age. They were experiencing those things. What was it? Like a couple of years ago, they found what they believe is the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah mm -hmm. and that they were basically leveled by what they call fireballs. Yes. So what happened? Okay, here's, I mean, this is like kind of, I hadn't thought about this. I didn't even know about this. I'm really starting to under, try to understand the stars because, you know, I live, you know, it's like I got to the point where it's just like, hey, how come these stars are up here? What are they, right? I've always been free, preoccupied by other things. But within the last year, I just go outside and just look at the stars. I'm totally amazed. Well, they're going through their own procession. They're going through their own cycle. And there was a time when it, there when things really were not the way they were. We think that everything is like all uniform and they've always been this way. Well, they weren't. So there are theories now and there's several things that I'm reading and it's like really starting to, you know, it's it's starting to sink in just how difficult this period was. Somewhere around about um 12,000 years ago or more, a supernova exploded. Okay. And it just, out, you know, it's like, I think it's like somewhere in the neighborhood of a thousand, you know, light years away. Well, anyway, it exploded. And all of this material from that explosion smashed into our solar system and into the earth. And it sent all kinds of things from way out there into our solar system. So now we're being bombarded by all these comets and all those other fragments 
from all these different sources. Now, the question is, is whether or not they were from outside our solar system or inside our solar system. There is speculation now that Venus wasn't a planet about 5,000 years ago. Really? It was, it just emerged out of Jupiter and things were spitting out of Jupiter. All these fireballs were spitting out of Jupiter. And we, when, when they just sent this stuff out, when our sun or our planet revolved around the sun, we came smashing into all of that debris. Wow. I had not heard of that about as far as Venus, but I so, know Jupiter is huge, but yeah. Okay. So the question is, is when in human storytelling, was Venus ever around? I mean, let's just go back and look at the storytelling from all these different cultures. Yo, there's no Venus. It's Mercury. It's Mars. It's planet Earth. It's Jupiter. It's Saturn. It's the moon and the wow. sun. There's no Venus. And then all of a sudden, Venus shows up. And Venus is a bright, It's you can see it. It's called the morning star. Yeah. Okay, well, it ends up showing up now all over the world in all of these cultures, in all of these stories that all of a sudden this star, the morning star appeared. Where was it before? It smashed into it. It came crashing into our solar system and disrupted everything. It threw everything out of balance. So do you think that because of that, that was one of the effects or the causes of things that happened yes. was like you said let's say we had a an asteroid yeah. like all or... of a sudden there was an ice age and now there's no ice age anymore right yeah there was an ice age there's no ice age anymore all of a sudden the earth is getting just pummeled by all yes. this fiery fragmentation which is all the fire coming from sky it yes. happened and it's part of our collective memory and after that event the world was shattered Yes, it. There it, are things, um, and I'm sure you know, right? The mastodons that are up there in Siberia, right? And that you find in Siberia now all the time, right? And so, what is it? They were they were alive when they died of the cold. Yes, yes. That's and the what... food that they were eating, get a load of this: the food that there was in their stomach, which was preserved, was from there in the north, up there, like at at the Arctic Circle. Okay. They had just eaten food that was in the south of Russia. So all of those time zones, right, or all that distance from the lower section to the top section, on an instantaneous level, these, these animals died with fresh food in their mouths yes. and in their stomachs. Exactly. What happened? That was that was, we're talking here about a very swift climate change. Really All of swift. a sudden, something just happened instantaneously that they would die. And that the whole, it's like the whole earth, the whole skin of the earth, everything just shifted and moved. The poles shifted, the earth, all the crust, everything just broke up. Things sank, other things rose. All yes. of a sudden, the Sahara Desert or the Sahara, which is Northern Africa, went from wooded savannah tropical to a desert in a sense overnight how'd that happen so the egyptians left okay so now there's like the six thousand year period of time in which or five thousand whatever it is there's they call it the blank period they don't know what happened they just left and then they came back I and started all over again with all this new to that same area off uh, around the nile yeah, because the Nile completely got flooded and it was completely shifted all over. Probably even possibly even drew up um uh dried up. I don't know all that. So I mean that's you know Oh no, but that... you know, you always hear that um the Nile for I mean without the Nile there would there could be have been no Egypt as far as the civilization that's and that's correct. You would not have an Egyptian civilization without the Nile. In fact, there's uh, you have the Hindus Valley in in India, and you have the the Mesopotamian, you know, plateau with the Tigris and the Euphrates, and you have the Nile. Mm -hmm. Those were the three huge areas where they call that 
you know, historically they call that the core, the core right. of civilization. Those the three civilization. valley systems were really, you know, heated yeah. up and thriving. Yeah, that area between the Tigris and the Euphrates. Yeah. As far as ancient civilizations were concerned. Yeah, yeah. Now, but, I've been to Turkey, and I've been over on that side. Uh, okay. Lake Vaughn and Mount Ararat. And let me tell you, man, I got there, and it was just like, oh, my God, I feel like I am home. That really? is how I felt when I got over there. I was right at the base of Mount Ararat, and like, holy cow, I feel like this is where I came from. I knew it. It was in my bones. I knew it. The other place that, you know, I've kind of done some traveling. So the other place I, I felt like that level of kinship to was Rome. So <laughs> there you go. Have, have you seen that they've been, and this is, I, I want to segue. So have you seen that people have been defacing the Colosseum? I'm very upset about that. <laughs> Why? I have no idea. Oh, they just I, like inscribing their names in it? Well, yeah, there was one. First, there was one that did something like, you know, I, and they're saying, well, we didn't, they, they didn't know. I'm like, how can you not miss, like, it's a Coliseum. All right. And then now, now I heard another second person that did it, a woman. I was like, I don't get it. What is this? You know. Same um, thing's happening in Egypt at some of the, the temples. Really? You're yeah. The, people are just deciding they just want to etch their name into the columns. It's kind of weird. I don't understand that. I, I just <laughs> don't. Either. I mean, I, 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 <laughs> you come, you and I come from a different, <laughs> from a different cloth. <laughs> we are completely from different cloths. How can I say, I see it as whatever it is. If it's a historical thing, whether I like it, I don't like it. It's pretty, it's ugly. Well, I don't care. It's like, okay, leave it. Al I, I, I have a lot of respect for historical stuff. Let's face it. There's just very few of it left behind as exactly. far as, um, and exactly, Why would you so want to face it? Some, we have to have some level of preser preservation of it. So now, I, let me ask you: wait, So you went to all these places, and you had like the aha moment, like, "Hey, this is oh, great." Oh, well, the, at, at Mount Ararat, so that's where you know Noah's Ark is supposed to be at the top of Mount Ararat. Right. But um, I had a real strong connection to that place, and then the other one was in Rome. So I was walking around Rome, just you know. I've been here before. I know it. And I loved it. So, well, have you been yeah. to Rome? No, I have not. I have not. But you it's know a what? treat. When, and that's the thing that, uh, what was it now? That That's why I think that even without me being there, um, when you think of people doing that to historical places, and I think to myself, you know, whether besides the fact that you're defacing it, you're like robbing every other tourist, hello, that wants to go see the Coliseum without, hey, so and so is here, whatever. I'm just making stuff up here, but no, I get it. And it's not um, what I came here for. I don't want to see your stuff on there. However, graffiti's been around for a long time. I know, I know. So, Let me ask you time. that you, that you, when you went, um, was there any other place besides? I'm going to say this. Did you ever find yet? Like, how's the thing? Not, not besides the feeling of saying I've been here before. Did you ever had, uh, I'm thinking, even though I know you've read about a lot of these places that you've gone to, did you ever have what they call one of those lucid dream experiences where basically you were seeing what this place looked like back whatever time, not modern times? No, I haven't had that experience. However, Okay. <laughs> this is, there is a, however here. Okay. So I, from my earliest memories, I have always been a dreamer. I've always just remember dreams, have dreams. And it's important for me to keep my connection to myself, to the dream world. Right. Right. So I'm not a real big fan of uh, alcohol or drugs or anything, or even just, you know, medical drugs. Cause it, it, it messes up this connection that I have that I need. Okay. Well, so I'm eight years old and I have a dream and I go, I have no idea what that's all about. I'm 10 years old. I have no idea what this dream's about. I can't even describe you what the dreams were. Okay. They're about places inside buildings, all, you know, all this kind of stuff. I have no idea. Okay. I'm with, so I was part of a group that built a uh, sacred circle in Turkey 
And okay. what we had to do is we had to drive around to every single border with the exception of Greece and touch the border and bring back dirt. Okay. So okay. that meant we went to Georgia, Armenia, Iran, Iraq, it's Syria, and then up to Bulgaria. So we're on the very eastern edge over in the Iraqi area. And I walk into a building and I went, oh, my God. This is the dream I had as an eight-year-old. Oh. Like and then we go, to another town, we go to another town and we go into another building. And I went, oh, my God, this is the building that I was in when I was 10. Hmm. So. I didn't have what you're talking about, but I had other experiences. That, that's where, a, well, what, I know that it's, but it sounds like a deja vu moment, but you know, there was years a in between one point and the other. Dream. It's a deja vu me, moment, uh, moment from a dream in which it took, what was that? 30 something years. Yeah. 30 years for it to pass. How about meeting? You know how sometimes, you know what they call, whether you want to call it synchronicity did you ever have those moments of synchronicity, whether you were at a certain place or you met a certain person or things that happened that you look back at and you go, this, this was meant to be like. Okay. Um, so I've been open up to the idea of just allowing. Okay. There's two things here, you know, like sometimes you just have to set a plan. You have to write it down and you have to go after it. Okay. Other times, yes. you know, it's like me was, I, I'm going to write down questions. And at one point I said, you know, I'm having all these dreams and I don't know anything about them and I don't know the language to it. And I don't know how to interpret that. I end up, because this is kind of um, addresses your point. I okay. end up going to a party and I meet this guy and he says, Hey, have you ever been to the the Young Institute? And I had been reading Carl Young. And I said, no, I don't even know anything about it. And he says, oh, yeah, it's a great place if you want to have your dreams interpreted. I go, really? He goes, oh, yeah, and out of the blue, right? Uh-huh. <laughs> Isn't that great? That's I what go, I'm really? talking about. And he goes, oh, yeah, what you do is you call them up and they'll set you up with a therapist so that they can you can do a young unit, a, a, a analyst by with a young analyst interpreting your dreams. So that happened to me. And of course, the other thing that happens to me is since I'm so interested in reading books and, and things like that, books just show up. Oh, yeah. God. You yes. know, and I don't mean yeah. it like they just like, you know, all of a sudden there's a book on my floor. And well, where'd that come from? You know, you know, like you know, man. Of right. Heaven. Right. But no, literally, it's like I'm over here. Hey, this book seems to be calling me or I go to the library. This, this, this. So book seems to be the my connection to. Okay. I guess they're my oracles. Okay. Sure. <laughs> so yeah. Instead yeah, of having an oracle at Delphi that's sitting over, you know, a vent, you know, inhaling all kinds of nauseous, nauseous fumes, you know, I go to these, I go to libraries or I, uh, I'm at bookstores or I just find books. And now those books are like seeding me and now helping me grow because of the very thing that I need. So that's right. Part of what happens. And it's the thing me. that, how can I say it? And sometimes the only impetus behind it is the thought of it that you that's might all, think sometimes that's it. Uh, Hey, you know, I'm thinking, well, you know, what would be a good thing to read or something along those lines, something that eh, you're thinking about. And all of a sudden circumstances come around and there you are, well, whether it's I, one in particular or whether you're open to like something different. Yeah. Well, so case in point, just recently, like last year, last summer, I just started looking up at the stars and I go, God, I don't know anything about this stuff. Nothing. I don't know the names of the stars. I don't know. I, I just, they're always there. They're in the background. Right. And I don't pay much attention to them. So finally I started to think, Hey, you know what? Let's just look, go out there every night and just say hello to them. Mm -hmm. And the one that seemed to be the one that I recognized um, was Orion and yeah, the Orion's other stars well. of the constellation of Orion. So every night I went out there and I just was looking at it and I was praying to it and I was just thanking it. And I was just like, Hey, you know what? How about you give me some information? You know, <laughs> yeah. I'm always open to information. Is there any wisdom? Right. So I would do this on a regular basis. Like I wouldn't almost every night. And finally things are starting to show up based off of the stars, the information of the stars. So I did, uh, since uh, the beginning of June, I've uh, 
I was I just started reading all the books on um, stone circles okay. and um, energy lines mm -hmm. and um, all that material. And so what I'm finding is, is that there's a direct connection that all of our ancestors had to the stars that we don't have anymore. But the stars are telling stories. Sure. I mean, you see so stories. many. Um, all this kind of information. Temples or through. they were aligned certain ways. That's correct. And, uh, it was and, uh, almost precisely, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. In yeah. There the was no direction. Yeah. So th th that's all very fascinating to me. So anyway, and when now, you're thinking of, let's use the word primitive people. Yeah, I don't want, well, I don't mean, I just like our ancestors, right? Well, no, no. What I'm saying is that we think of ourselves as having all this technology, you right. know, and astronomy and blah, 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 blah. We know everything. Right. It is like way back then, yeah, even now, and I'm sure you've seen it, especially if it sounds like you've been to all these places where what's left of them, that even now they can't quite figure out how they built some of these things. Yeah, whether it's the pyramids or other places, yep, that they look at them, and it's not like they built them. It's like um, they were done so well. Uh, there's a exactly. There's a, and, and it's not that you could say, well, this one civilization they had uh, back in like 1834. This was in Huaca, Mexico, and uh, one of the provinces in Mexico, where you know this is in that area where Chichen Itza and all these things were on the Yucatan. They, Right on the Yucatan, they found these quarries of these stones that are like one to three tons, and because they found some other discoveries, and they were they were thinking, okay, they source these stones from this quarry, and they found that was one of the things that this place was abandoned. Like you know, a lot of these places are abandoned. It's like almost like what you said. Everybody drops everything and leaves. Um, and even then, now. Because everybody thinks, oh, the, the pyramid of Egypt is the one they can't figure out. Even now they can't figure out, forget how they built it. How were they able to transport some of these stones the way they did over some of the terrain from one point to the other just to get to work on it? All right. Yeah, who's involved with making exact shaped stones? All of them the same shape. Like you have to have like... You know, I've done a lot of woodworking and metalworking. And so you can okay. set up a whole process in which you have the same piece coming out all the time, right? Because you got these machines. Sure. You can't do it by hand. Right. It's almost impossible to do this stuff by hand on on an industrial scale. Right, and right, right. Exactly. And that's what we're talking about here. Right. This is mega industrial stuff sense. Well, you know what? That's really interesting coming from you david that you work with your hands yeah as far as building yeah as far as it's very important to, to reproduce something without machinery how would you well be able that's to do a it? different story I, i'm totally into tools so i'm part of the well when i mean machinery i mean like you know how like you know you put a machine or let's say a saw that you can say i'm gonna cut it at this angle and i know i can put a bunch of er, er, that I'm talking about what would be available, let's say, to these civilizations. Yeah. That, that you would think, okay, these people only basically had tools. Hand tools. Hand tools, right? Hand tools. That's it. I, no, I, no. What? All I had was a hammer and a chisel, and they did that? Go try uh -huh. it. Please go try <laughs> it. And, and tell me how, how you did. How yes. many blocks of stone did you make today? <laughs> yes. Yes. Yes, and they even found uh, close. There's a there's a, a very point. old. Um, yeah. I don't know if you've heard of it. It's an old. Uh, it's called Mitla. It's a uh, basically they they had a, like an Acropolis, and this was be these basically these people were chased out by the Aztecs. So this is pre Aztec civilization. Not only did they build these things, they even had subterranean chambers that were carved into rocks and stuff. Uh -huh. And you're like, how did they do that stuff? Uh, yeah, that's incredible. And why subterranean? Yeah. So uh, subterranean has something to do with the way in which energy works, right? So now it's all about oh, energy sure. work. Okay. So what happens when you have an underground system, whether there's water in it or not, and now right. you in, invoke whatever it is that you're invoking? So, for example, um, I went to Shark Cathedral, and it mm -hmm. happened to be on 
it, it was either the 24th of December or the 23rd. So we're looking at the winter solstice. Yes. And I walked in and of course I just had this, oh my God moment. <laughs> I bet. Just, and I'd already been to a number of other cathedrals, but this one, for whatever reason, just really struck me. And the um, children's choir was practicing for the, you know, the Christmas mass. Yes. And oh my God, it was, it, it, I swear, I, it's, you know, this is a total cliche, but it felt, it sounded like you're in heaven and you're looking right. around and there's, you know, this whole space just keeps going up and up and up and you got this music going and I ended up having an epiphany. And so I'm standing at the crossing, uh -huh. having this like mystical experience. So I've been thinking a lot about that. And I realized that one, whenever you have a sacred temple or structure on a ley line, yes, when you go to that spot on an equinox or solstice, mm -hmm. it magnifies the energy. And they also have underground scripts. So there's a whole underground system below this cathedral. So all of these ancient sites, for whatever reason, and I'm not really sure how this works on a metaphysical or an energetic level, but there seems to be chambers underneath these sacred spots. And yes. so when you go and you start activating these spaces with your voice, with motion, with intent, everything is magnified and that that like vacuum or that underground space is resonating at a higher frequency i think and then you because the whole building itself is a uh, a chamber of sacred geometry in yes. which it's all about frequency and how frequency vibrates you've now walked into a system in which the under the ground the building the sound and you on this on this day that's already highly energetic is vibrating at a super high rate and boy started imagine. having all kinds of new insights well look and i hate to say it i don't know um what happened to notre dame you know with the fire and stuff i know do you know that they found a whole bunch of people buried underneath the altar more than they thought originally <laughs> have you heard about all these no, uh, i haven't heard any of that i have maybe, seen you know, a program of them building been forced it. to well, you know, back then, you know, if you had, um, if you were a wealthy patron or somebody in the church, you usually you got buried in the church, you know, under the, you know, right. around the altar or whatever. That was like, this is, but they, they, they have found um, some tombs in unexpected places once they were doing the renovation of Notre Dame. Uh, and they're like trying to figure out pe unexpected people. How's this? Not somebody like, you know, somebody that was well off or somebody in the high, that was high up in the hierarchy of the church. Yeah. So they're trying to figure out, well, why was this person interred there in Notre Dame? Right. You know? Oh, interesting. Yes. It's, 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 I, I want to, I, I got to follow up on it. I dropped those things and then I follow up a couple of months to see, you know, now with DNA, they could figure out a lot of stuff. But even then, sometimes you don't get the exact picture about, like, let me ask him, David, when you've done, let's say, when you did this study, it's the, we're going to get back to Jesus. Do you think that looking at him, uh, following him historically took away from his divinity or no? Um, I think he just put him in perspective. Right. So we have a theological understanding mm -hmm. of him. In fact, that's pretty much all we have. Sure. So for me, I had a theological understanding, but then I started to ask questions that, you know, because I was uh, done so much building, you know, it's like, well, we just want this building and you can't just go <laughs> with your hand up and we just want it like that. And you go, right. okay, well, that requires engineering that requires, you know, building that requires materials that requires all, you know, you just go down and I call it nuts and bolts. Okay. Right. We need nuts. We need bolts. We need nails. We need, you know, lumber. Is it, you know, is this all two by four or is this, you know, two by sixes? Where are we going to transfer the load, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You got to deal with these nuts and bolts issues. Otherwise, you're going to have a, a structure that's going to collapse on you. OK, exactly. So I went, OK, let's just let's just break this whole thing down. And I'll just look at it purely from the point of view that he's got these sayings. And I know what the sayings are. I've already done the study of it. And then I'm going to go ahead and compare it with the New Testament. And I'm going to say, okay, uh, 
the primary thing about the New Testament is that he walked around a lot. So yes. he said things and he walked around a lot. Okay, that seems to be the, you know, things that are, I'm going to say, are like 100% true. Yes. Now we go, okay, let's go back and let's read the sources historically of what was happening at the time of the first century. Okay. So we have from zero, right? Because that's when Jesus was born, <laughs> zero. Mm -hmm. right? right. So we have a whole new time clock, calendar, right? Uh, and now he dies roughly 33 years later. Okay. Or, you know, there's some variation of what that time time frame is. Well, what right. was going on? Okay. And then we also have another milestone. And that milestone is, is the, the Jewish and the, the Roman war. And it terminated in the year 70 with the destruction of the temple. And then a few years later, the destruction of Masada. Okay, so now we know there's some, in, you know, we have some benchmarks here. Yes. So if, what was it like before that? What was going on? So what were the Romans doing? What were the Greeks doing before that? Okay, so if you keep going back in history and history and history, you know, and back and back in time, eventually you'll just kind of, a lot of things will get lost. But if you kind of go back and just say, hey, what was very prominent in their minds? Well, Alexander the Great showed up. And after yes. he died, then this area fell under the control of one of his generals. It was called Seleucid. And the other general down in Egypt was Ptolemy. Okay, so what right. did they do? Well, they were Greek. And they really didn't like, you know, well, the Seleucid didn't like the, the Jewish religion. Because they thought the religion was stupid. And he didn't think it was like very smart because the Greeks were interested in all this, uh, you know, Plato and Aristotle and the likes. Uh -huh. and so they persecuted them. Okay, so now you have that Maccabean Wars. So then they, you know, the, the the Jewish people finally freed them. The they freed themselves of the Greeks only for the Romans to arrive. Okay, right. So now you have all of this like they're now subjected people. Okay, and Jesus shows up during a time of subjection right. in which Greco-Roman ideas are now prevalent in their land and the priests have to make sacrifices to Caesar, like I mentioned to you before. Yes. People went nuts. They literally went nuts. And you had a king, Herod, who was not a pure blood Jew. He was half Jewish because he was half Arab. People were he furious over this. So there was a man exactly. by the name of Judas the Galilean. So this is where all of a sudden history starts to light up the whole universe here for me. There's a man by the name of Judas the Galilean. Funny, he's mentioned twice in the book of Acts. Okay. Well, I went, well, who is this guy? Because they just mention him like in passing. Like, oh, well, you know, and that's the time when Judas the Galilean did his kind of thing. You know, that's like, was so cavalier and so dismissive of it. And I went, well, I wonder what Josephus Flavius has to say about this guy. Okay. So I got the book, you know, on histories of this, you know, the histories of the Jew. And, 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 I, and I started to read that whole section about Judas the Galilean from Josephus's perspective because he lived there. Okay. A little beyond, a little after Judas the Galilean. So I would imagine, do you know anybody from the South? Do you know people from the South? Yes. Yeah. Tell of me, course. what's it like when they talk about the Civil War? Different perspective. Like yesterday this happened. <laughs> yeah, different perspective. Yes, absolutely. I mean, and, oh, yeah, my great grandfather fought in that. They know. Yeah. Right? Yeah. They know. Okay, so I went, the, the, you know, the Jews have a very long memory. And they're going to remember this. So Josephus is going to tell me something, whether it's absolutely 100% accurate or if it's even if it's in the ballpark, this is really important. Okay. Okay. Judas the Galilean said, in, in effect, all you Jews, we we freed ourselves from the Greeks. And now we have, we're free. But now you Jews have decided we're going to take on or we're going to accept Roman rule. And they're going to put all these puppets, whether they be the, the king or whether they be the priests, in our land, and they're going to tax us. And 
he said, if you get taxed and you accept the census, I'm going to kill you. Oh, boy. Okay. Okay. And he did. So all these people in the Galilee, this is the Galilee. So this is where Jesus is from. This is where Jesus uh-huh. is from. So in the Galilee, Judas the Galilean went on this rampage and torched all these villages, killed all these people, killed all the livestock, killed all their their um, their way of living. Okay, he just and he's destroyed. Jewish. And he's Jewish. He just destroyed it all. He says, none of you belong to God. None of you believe in God. None of you want your freedom. And so the best thing for you is to all die. And I am the avenging angel. And I'm going to kill every single one of you. And he had a whole army. And he did just that. Let me ask you. I was about to ask you, who is this guy? Because not everybody usually has the ability to like. Yeah. I mean, this he was a he was a rabbi. He was, and okay. he had enough. He was furious okay. with all these people finally just saying, oh, well, we'll just acquiesce to the Roman Empire and to Roman rule. And he was adamant. No, nope, it's better to die than to do this. So he was on that roll. Okay, so guess what? Judas the Galilean went to all these villages. And then when you read the New Testament, Jesus went to the exact same places. Okay. So what is the first thing that Jesus says? Peace be with you. Why? Because the last time someone showed up with some people, he murdered them all. Let me ask you, do you think the problem with Jesus was that they wanted a warrior and instead they got the guy that kept saying love each other? Yes. Okay. So now the question is, we now have this thing called Jesus who brought this new idea. And my feeling is, is that he... uh it seems unlikely that he would not have gone. This is a double negative, but he went to India. He spent time in India. Right. So when I looked and analyzed all of his sayings and um, I looked at, you know, where the inspiration and where the sources would have come from, the East is a very prominent place where these ideas are originating from. They're not Hebrew. Okay. So, um, There seems, and then there's all this tradition that Jesus was there and his name was Isa at the time. Do you think he he ever made it to Japan? Because I've heard a version of that too. I I, I can't address that. I can address that he spent time in India. So the question is, is how much time, when did he go? How did he get there? Okay, so I found out that there was a way that you can get to India. Now, what I have read is that the Silk Road was not open until Hadrian, who was in the second century and he was the emperor of Rome, it wasn't until he showed up that there was now a new connection to the Silk Road that went to China. Okay. And that would have been north. Okay. But there was another route that you can take to get to India. So if you go from um, Jerusalem, And you go down to the Red Sea, you can catch a boat. And then from the boat, you can sail down the bottom of the Red Sea and then out the Straits of Hormuz, and you can get to the southern tip of Yemen. And then if you got there at the right time, the trade winds would blow to the towards the east. So you just put your sail up and you get in a boat and it would take you right to the west coast of India. Okay. And they knew where that was. Okay. And knew, you know, wh- which port to go to. And they so did. So the logistics are there as far as the yeah. possibility. Okay. okay. So then the trade winds, after about six months or so, would turn around and blow the other way. <laughs> so if you timed it right, <laughs> you, you can go, go there and then come back with the winds behind you. So there was that route. Okay. Because so there's always, be- they say these years that Jesus was like, what was he doing with his time? You know, that. Well, most likely he was probably studying in some um, monastery at the base of the Himalayas. Okay. All right. Okay. So how would I, you know, is there some way of like verifying that? All I can say is that there seems to be a couple of things that he is very uh, in tune with. And they, there's a great deal of Eastern mysticism and Eastern theology that he is conversant with whether it be Confucianism 
whether it be Taoism, whether it be Buddhism, or whether it be Hinduism. He's okay. uh, he, he's well versed in it. In fact, his ministry is a highly Buddhist ministry because it is a ministry dedicated towards the dissolution of the ego. So okay. as Jesus, he even says, Jesus says, the more, the more um, the father kind of comes into him, the less I become, right? The less I become, the more God, the father takes on. Okay. Well, that's a very Buddhist concept. So he's now being infilling with his version of a practice that has Buddhist origins to it. So okay. there was there was like no one else that was kind of like doing what he was doing and talking about. Now, so this was because this is this, this doesn't sound like Jewish teachings kind of. No, thing. It, it isn't. You know, so then when you get into the Gospel of Thomas or got well, Thomas, and then you also get into the Gospel of John, there's a very strong influence of Hinduism. So Jesus said, will say the father and I are one. OK, well, that's very Hindu because. Okay. Um, the, the small self, you, and the big self, the divine, are one and the same. It's just size. Okay. So, the, the, you know, if I were to go in, down to the ocean and I had a cup or a bucket and I fill the bucket up with the water from the ocean, the water in the bucket and the water in the ocean are the same thing. They're not different. And that's the way the Hindus saw the self. So the big self okay. and the small self are divine. They're this one and the same thing. So when Jesus says that, he's saying something that is that is Hindu. That isn't right. Jewish. They don't believe that at all. They didn't think that way at all. That's not to say that they didn't feel like there was a Holy Spirit inside of them. Right, right, right. Never but yeah, that's not come. the way they would have thought of they explaining never would have it. gone down that other road. They just wouldn't have. That's not it. Because there's God, the creator, and then we're the creation. And Hinduism blends, you know, kind of dissolves that boundary. Okay. Uh, so the other thing that Jesus learned and I, I explored this in my book, and that is, I call it uh, feats of endurance. So what are feats of endurance? Well, raise your hand. How many people can go on a fast for 40 days out in the desert? <laughs> raise your hand. Right? I'll tell you something. I'm, no I'm, one. I'm hurting over they are over four hours and I'm hurting. What are you talking That's about? Right. 40 days. So 40 days. I'd Come be on. like, oh. Thank you. Okay. And then, oh, I'm going to conduct my ministry I'm going to do a traveling ministry versus say John the Baptist who would just say, Hey, I'm over here at the, you know, the river Jordan and everybody come over here and get baptized. Or you can kind of go into the Essenes who are living out in the desert, you know, Qumran. And, you know, maybe they had a couple of people that would, they would send out as emissaries, you know, to kind of teach. But Jesus was teaching not in a school and not with like a, uh, normal people right he was going around getting he was rounding up all these you know all these different people and all these different types of people and he was going from town to town and village to village and little city to city all throughout the galilee you know getting followers so the question is is how many people followed him you know was it a lot was it a little you know who knows right um but you know it kind of raises the question or raised the question for me is like, well, what's the church? I mean, if you went from village to village to village in your whole time that you were going around doing all this stuff, how many times did you go back and visit the same place that you just left? You know, exactly. My guess is that he probably hit one or two, or he probably hit a couple of them twice, maybe three times. So, and believe me, when you kind of go and do what he did, you start looking at the Lord's prayer and you say, you know, um, it, it, there's five things. So, the, you know, the, the, the front end and the back end all are giving God, you know, some level of glory and acknowledgement. And then the other ones are, you know, uh, food. So give me my daily bread. Um, mm -hmm. You know, my, lead, don't, you know, lead me not into temptation and then, you know, forgive those. Right. Forgive those right. people. Right. So I would imagine Jesus was using that as a template for wherever he went into all these new villages and all these little new towns. So he'd go from place to place to place. 
And you know that the people, when he walked into these places, one, they just remember that guy named Jesus the Galilean that slaughtered, you know, their family before. And he's showing up, so they're probably very suspicious. So he's saying, peace be with you. And, and like, he's um, trying to give them some spiritual insight and help them through their own ego and try to teach um, compassion. Right. So maybe some people liked it and some people didn't. And then some people followed him and probably most didn't. But he would keep on doing that. But that's how he used the Lord's Prayer in that manner. Do you think that what led to, I try to think, you know, without being there. And of course you studied that time period more. I don't, you know, when you think about it, um, do you think his crucifixion really came about because the Jews, the, the, whether it was the priest or I just had enough of him, because I really don't think, I think he was flying under the radar as far as the Romans were concerned. Or am I wrong about that? Um, um, Nothing flew under the radar for the, from the Romans. Well, I'm talking in as far as executing somebody. Okay. Even though I know the Romans okay. can be pretty bloodthirsty. but People were aware of what Jesus was doing because it was, it was kind of undermining the authorities, the, you know, not only the political authority, the religious authority, and then also, in a sense, the Roman authority. But the Romans, they were kind of... As long as you weren't causing problems, as long right. as you were protesting, as long as you weren't, you know, you were still paying your taxes, mm -hmm. uh, they were kind of tolerant about a lot of stuff. But they knew uh, what you were doing. They, they, and so did the Jews. So they, they all had spies. Right. But to me, I'm thinking that, Turkey, is that everybody the has Romans spies. were. So this guy's walking around with a bunch of other guys. And women. Everybody. Love one and another. Women. And women, well, if you go with Mary Magdalene. Yeah. yeah. And to the, I'm thinking at it from a Roman perspective. It's like, you, it's like okay, so this guy's running around telling everybody love one another, turn the other cheek, that kind of stuff, whatever. Okay. Right. I don't know. In other words, I don't, because I, I know that for the Romans, it was like, are you a threat to us, military? You know, right. can you come and, uh, you know, mount an army and come against us? Jesus right. doesn't fit into any of that. And it you was know. probably never, I don't think he ever raised any type of army the size of uh, exactly. Judas the Galilean. No. So, I mean, I know that the, I think that there's an exaggeration, you know, when it talks about how many people follow Jesus and it was just like this huge multitude. And, you know, there is mention of that he did have 60 disciples. So 12 was one thing. And then there were 60, you know, kind of mentioned as a side note. Oh. And, you know, I don't know if it's like, hey, we're when you come to town, we're going to go and listen to you versus the ones that traveled with him. I don't know. Yeah. Okay. So getting back to the crucifixion. So Jesus decided right. it was time to, you know, there was a point in which I, I felt like there was a blood sacrifice that he was willing him to take and accept. Okay. So um, obviously uh, the Passover is a great time. Uh, because there is a, a a type of theater that Jesus was aware of. I mean, he was a master um, publicist, so to speak. Okay. And um, he knew how to take. Uh, he understood when opportunities. So okay. he either created his own opportunities, or he always was taking advantage of opportunities. And the biggest opportunity that he had um, when it came to the Passover was to go down there. And make a scene. And okay. he did. And he accepted what he had to do as probably a voice of God talking to him, saying, now is the time to spill blood. And okay. I think that there is this, again, it goes back to these mystery plays that I was telling you about earlier in, the, in our conversation. And that is, if you are enacting a particular play, you are making it real. And it's not just, it's like imprinting this reality into the world. And he knew how to do that. And so he brought with him this one, the sacrifice, and two, turning the, you know, the wine into, um, or excuse me, water into wine. Mm -hmm. And then there's the sacrament, sacrament 
which is very Egyptian, of taking something and eating of it and then taking right. on the substance of that because there's a right. transmutation. transmutation. And so that's alchemical. That's an alchemical yes. reality of which Jesus was fully aware of. And he he did the passion play, he did the sacrifice, and he provided that that transmutational element. And those are really big issues. So now the question do you think, is do you think Jesus knew all along this was going to be his end? Or was it when he was closer to the time of his death that he realized? I, you always hear that he was always aware that this. Well, that let's just say that. Do this. this is how I felt. I felt that Jesus knew that by going out and doing his uh, ministry, mm -hmm. that that was a set one. It was a, quote, living sacrifice. Okay. And two, that it was a death sentence. Because he okay. was literally going up against the, the powers that, that be. And he's already going up against people's preconceptions of what sh should be. So everybody was looking. And this is, okay, so I, I didn't mention this, but I'm going to mention it now because I'm now thinking about it. So if you go back and you say, hey, it, um, what, does, what are the Jews thinking about when it comes to this Messiah? Um, what is he supposed to be doing? Okay, so what, is, what are the examples that I have that would key me into understanding what this Messiah is going to look at. Okay, so I'll go back and I start looking at my history. And you go, hey, look what Moses did to uh, Ramses. Uh, okay, that's a really good one. Okay, look what Joshua did. You know, when he goes into Canaan and he takes over Cana Canaanite, the Canaanites. Uh, let's just go and look what David did to um, Goliath to preserve the... Uh, Jewish monarchy in the Jewish state. And then look at what the Maccabeans did when they um, pushed the Greeks out. Okay, so you got four really, really good examples of what it means to be subjected. And someone is going to come, they're going to be anointed by God okay. to, to change the dynamic, to free this suppressed people from the oppressor. Okay. okay. That's in their mindset. Right. So when people say, walked up to Jesus, they'd say, hey, are you the Messiah? <laughs> well, that's the, and, and that's my point. All those examples that you did, they, they, they fought. They actually fought like a warrior type of thing. Mm -hmm. And here's Jesus. And Jesus is not like coming around going, you know what? We're going to overthrow these Romans and we're going to get them out of here. And he didn't say any of that. Okay. No, he didn't. So he does exactly the opposite. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Walk an extra mile. I mean, there's all those, you know, all of his teachings when it comes to just what to do. Right. Right. So it's how like, love, how was to, that what how got everybody all mad? It? Was that he was not fulfilling what they thought? Because I right. imagine they were waiting for somebody to come around and say, hey, we're I'm going to be the one that's going to get the Romans out of here. And we're going to. And the freedom it, okay, they're looking that for. happens. That happens again with another Galilean. <laughs> so the Galileans, it's John the Baptist, yes. Judas, the Galilean, Jesus. And then you get Josephus, the guy that was writing about what was happening. In um, first century Judea. OK, he was a. Uh, I think he was a, a Pharisee. Yeah, I think he was a Pharisee. So he was part of the, you know, the Jewish teaching. Okay. And he was part of a group that decided they wanted to get rid of the Romans. And they did. So the Galileans formed an army and went after the um, the Romans, and if I'm not mistaken, it was in the valley, uh, you know, Armageddon Valley, you know, where all of the book of Revelation says everything's going to happen. They went out, met the Roman legion, which is, you know, that's like, that's the equivalent of a, a panzer division, you know, yeah. <laughs> in Nazi Germany. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is yes. not anything you want to be dealing with because you're right. most likely going to lose. Mm -hmm. Well, the Galileans defeated the Romans handily, they just destroyed them. And then, so that is the idea that there is this, you know, 
someone is going to rise up and defeat yes, exactly. Roman. Exactly. Okay. Well, Jesus didn't. He wasn't even part of that way of thinking. So, do you think that's what got him into trouble? I'm just no, saying. No, I think he went down to Jerusalem. Okay, here's just just think about this for a second. He goes down to Jerusalem at Passover, and there's you know several hundred thousand people from all over you know the diaspora coming to make their pilgrimage to Jerusalem, you know, to go through this whole feast and this the Passover uh, ritual. So you have an audience of 100,000 people. Well, what is the whole purpose of the Passover? It's Jewish liberation from the Egyptians. Right. Well, the Romans are going, okay, Don't I understand what this is about, but let me tell you, we're not letting anybody go around here starting any nonsense here. We're going to kill them. So Jesus goes in and he starts turning over the tables. So he was deliberately provoking people to have eyes on him and it turned out to be the the jewish uh religious establishment so the romans got involved only after right right that's what i meant the, that they were the, like you know, the romans like, had like, nothing to do with this it was the jews that said hey kill this guy he's a he's a troublemaker and they're going well what did he do well nothing really oh well what do you want me to do so exactly exactly that's what you always feel like you know that as far as the might of rome how's that uh, jesus was just some guy walking around you know hey believe like, me pontius pilate was he was uh he was really mean and vicious and nasty and he'd yeah. killed a lot of jewish people for you know just slight protests he uh -huh. was slaughtering them right and left so he oh, had no, no. no problem doing that but you know in this particular case it just seems like you know, um, what is he really doing here other than disrupting, you know, the money changers? <laughs> well, I think like every, I uh, was like, they, nobody wants to get, nobody wants to be used. And I'm sure Pontius is like, what are you trying to use me for? You know, well, you're trying to uh, do, get me to do the dirty work. Right. And so part of what Pontius Pilate is looking for, um, and this is part of the Roman way of doing things, is that all of the best positions and appointments and assignments all went to um, pure blood Romans. <laughs> right. Okay, so Yeah, they were real big on family lines. Oh, yeah. So it was like, okay, who's going to be the governor of, you know, the Syria? Okay, well, that's like the best place to be. So that's, that's going to go to, you know, this guy over here. And then uh, how about Egypt? Okay, well, that's going to go to this guy. Okay, well, how about this little province in the total backwater land? That's going to go to a family that wasn't Roman, but decided to become Roman. You know, <laughs> that's where he comes along. So. So do you think he was just, yeah, I see what you mean. I see what you mean as far as. He, as had, far as, he had everything to lose and nothing to gain. Right. Yeah, exactly. All I'm, and I know that everything as far as Rome was exactly that. You you keep the people and we're, and we're getting our tax money. <laughs> So that, you know, we it's can very, build, build um, roads and feed and clothe our armies, our soldiers, our leaders. That's right. And um, the best way to, so there was two things that I can kind of use as an illustration. Okay. So the, the Romans are very much like the movie than the Godfather, but on a big scale. Right. Okay. Yeah. Just that's where that comes from. That's who they were. That's the way it all worked. I mean, it's just. It was all about power, who had power, and yes. they were exerting their power. And so there was that element. Okay. The other element is, the so one day I was in Las Vegas and um, celebrating my, my niece's birthday, and we were staying at Caesar's Palace. So I, you know, parked the car, I'm walking into the front lobby, and all of a sudden it just hit me. And I went, oh my God, here I am. And I'm just going to say this represents Rome. Here are all the sculptures. <laughs> Here's uh -huh. everything that represents Rome. The fighting, the sex, the gambling, <laughs> right? Right. And and when I, this all kind of came to me, not that, you know, uh, probably right after like 9-11. And so ISIS, at that moment, ISIS hadn't happened, uh -huh. um, you know, in the Middle East, but it happened a little later. And I went, oh, my God. What would happen if you dropped Las Vegas 
directly in the headquarters of ISIS at Raqqa. I wonder what would happen, right? I mean, here's a here's one of those intellectual. Let me tell you something. That'd be it. It'd like, be, it. What would happen if you put these two things together? They're gonna they're not gonna work together. It's not gonna even close to being happening. Okay, so now I understand what the Roman, the Greco-Roman world was like to most of the the you know the traditional Jewish people. So there was something of a problem here. So there was a couple of ways that you can deal with that. One, you can acquiesce and just say, hell, I'm just going to go and be, you know, a Roman, or I'm going to kind of lean on, you know, being part Roman or really be right. Roman, really accepting this. The other one was like, well, I'll be kind of half Jew, half Roman. And the other one was like, I just want to go back to my traditional roots. And a lot of people went back to their traditional roots because right. they knew that, that was safe and they knew what, what it was. The other stuff didn't make any sense and it didn't seem to work very well for them. So, Oh, when you're in a like, change, when you're in this like, cauldron of change, there are those three things that happen. And who, who are you? Who are you more worried that's going to get mad at you, the Romans or God? <laughs> like, okay. And and so the the Jews who were very devout realized yes, that course. there was that element. Like I'm going to go ahead and please God. Exactly, exactly. That that that. And and I hate to say it because I don't really believe in God and that those terms. But that when the when God came down on you, it wasn't good. <laughs> It yeah. was like that kind enough of fear. enough, right? Yeah. So it was a very complex right. time, and sure. Jesus was doing this uh, ministry, and I, you know, I, ministry because of who he was and what his mission was. Okay. The question now becomes: Is there something in the cycle of the stars that pointed? in this direction that he would show up what did because you find? in this in the cycle of the stars are cycles of ages okay and each age has its own determined direction and this was a time with the age of pisces that compassion caring more of the feminine energies are mm -hmm. supposed to be reintroduced in the world and jesus was doing that that's why the magi who are from the persian area uh -huh. the iranian iraqi area yes. they were astrologers they understood the meaning of the stars and they knew that there was a cycle and this was one of the cycles and that there was going to be somebody this teacher right that is going to show us what the new age is going to look like. And exactly. they knew. And they right. knew. And you know, when 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 you look at that, um, you know, when you go and you, you know, the story of the three wise men, the magi, what you know, they, they they're not they're not put off because they find them in a manger because they're following the star. Right. <clears throat> Even though he's supposed to be they they just they 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 understand they what in other words what you said what the stars say we're going to believe it we're not going to second guess it because we find this king has been born you know in one of the lowliest places he's not in a palace in other words right <clears throat> and this is and this is in contradiction to the way in which the ruler of the world the roman how he is born <laughs> Everything is like a complete parody. All the old, the, the New Testament gospels and part of the early Christianity is like a parody of what the kingdom of God looks like versus what the kingdom of the Romans look like. It was just the opposite. And if right, we take, no. if we understand that, we're going to understand a lot more of what the gospels were about. Oh, absolutely. As well. Yeah, there's a lot for thought there. Yeah. David, I want to thank you so much. It has been fascinating to speak to you because, like I said, you, you've gone there and you've done the legwork. Well, thank you. As far as research. All right. And, you know, what's accurate, what's historically accurate versus what isn't. And sometimes I imagine that it's got to take a lot of effort to, especially maybe when you get more than one source that's telling you something different from the other. Like, okay, where's the truth in this? That's right. 
Well, one of the things that I realized, and again, it's one of these like, you know, moments where you go on and start doing something and you don't have any clues to what is about to happen, but things started to happen. And that is, I started to realize that if you looked at the gospels and you started to see where they were written in time. Yes. And then I went, okay, let's just imagine I'm watching a movie. And if I'm watching a movie from the seventies, they're going to show, you know, this car and that car and that kind of hairstyle. And then if you go in the 60s, there's going to be a different hairstyle with a different kind of sayings. And then if you go into like World War II movies, you're going to see something completely different, right? And in a very short period of time, you know, 30 years, movies are going to show you what your culture is going through. Yes. Between dress, what men and women are thinking about. You know, what the motives are, what they look like, what they're engaged in, what their houses look like, what their cars look like, all of it. Yes. And as I was reading the Gospels, I went, hey, you know what was happening in the Roman Empire at this time? This. And see, there's this concept right there. There's all this little bleed through of different time through the Gospels that are not necessarily indicative of Jesus's time, but are indicative of the writer's time. And they are now talking and they're pointing their finger and saying, look, back here at the time of Jesus, this is what was going on. But they have their own kind of cultural slant from their own perspective because their perspective has changed because the world has changed. And the well, world and, and changed really radically in the year 70 when the Jewish temple was destroyed. I'm going to give you the ourselves. If, we've, if you've lived an X amount of years, well, in other words, that you have that advantage of looking back, let's say 40, 50 years into the past, that you were actually there, you experienced it. Yeah. Okay. How much different is it for you, somebody that, like your, like me, you, that were there versus somebody to say that was born in the year 2000, 1999? Yeah, it's very different. No matter how much they want to relate to it, it's not the same as when you were there. <laughs> That's right. No matter how much you could read, you could look at the movies or whatever. Or, uh, but if you weren't there at that moment, you could. It's not the same as thirty or forty or seventy years later. Okay, case in point. Again, I I, I like watching movies, so um, mm -hmm. I'll watch movies in which they're trying now. They're trying to depict what the eighties looked like or the seventies. <laughs> yeah, and they're taking their idea of wine and glasses of wine. And saying, oh, well, this was probably like what it was back then as well. There was none of that. Yeah. Or the idea of hugging people. There was none of that. It yeah. is now. Right. It wasn't exactly. then. Exactly. And that's the thing that unless you were there at that moment of living yeah. it, you get it. And, and I know what you mean. But sometimes I'll see me and I'll go, what are they doing? <laughs> you know? Okay. Amazing. Another case in point. I like World War II movies because I'm a World War II uh, buff. And so some of the movies that are coming out in World War II, if you go back and you watch the movies during the war and right after the war in about like seven or eight years after the war, you're going to mm -hmm. see a dialogue and a type of a person and what they were talking about. And they still have all the memory of what the war was like. And they have. Right. So they were recreating scenes and sets based off of their experiences. Then you jump forward and you're going, oh, we're going to make, make a World War II movie in the year 2000 or 2010. Right. And all of the parts and pieces that were common to all of those people that knew that are not yes. in this movie over here whatsoever. Right, exactly. Not, they don't talk that way. They don't act that yes. way. They don't have all, they don't have the equipment. Oh yeah, you have a Sherman tank or you have, you know, a half track. But there's all this other stuff that you don't have. And that's what I'm talking about. So yes. if you pay attention on a cultural level, you can see all those little details. The difference between somebody that was there versus somebody, even 70 years might not seem historically like a long time. Right. But for, for perspective wise, if it's something you're writing about, it is, it can make a tremendous it's difference. It's huge. It's huge. All so. right, David, thank you so much. Hey, well, Matthew, thank you for inviting you me. Are anything now? Do you have any projects in the works or anything like that? Um, well, I don't have any writing projects, but I've been doing a lot of work with my art. And so that's one thing that's keeping me busy. And then okay. um, I, uh, 
I've got some, uh, I, I've been doing a lot of design work, you know, uh, geometric designs. And uh, I'm going to take one of those designs and when it's not so hot, you know, like 109 and 110 degrees outside, I'm going to go take that design and um, put it out in my yard really and, with rocks. So that's going to be oh, the, cool. the one of the bigger, you know, projects on the house that I'm going to be doing. Yeah, I can see what you're going to wait for cooler weather. For my podcast listeners, David, do you want to give out a website address in case anybody wants to follow Yeah, you know, up? okay, so... Um, I wrote this book called Interviewing Jesus the Man, and I ended yes. up getting my rights back from my publisher. Okay. And so I don't have an outlet for that. So, you know, um, one day I will get it back out into the world. But in the meantime, okay. I do have a website. It's called, uh, you can reach me at www.davidcollis.com. And I'm also on Facebook, uh, David C. Collis. So if okay. you want to, you know, reach out to me and, uh, Tech, you know, give me a text or give me an email through my uh, website. Okay, absolutely. Again, thank you so much. It's been absolutely wonderful. And I want to wish the best of luck. Thank you. Take care. All right. Bye-bye. Yeah. Let me tell you something. That's, uh, that's love of, of material. Let me tell you, when you talk, the reason why I say this, I have two sons. I have one. That's it's it's almost like I'm listening to it. It's like, man, you're my combo kids. I have one kid who is he builds, he you give you give him anything, he'll build you a barbecue, he'll build you a shed, he'll build you a small house. He the way his brain works, he sees something and he gets it. Like this is he doesn't even need instructions, he just puts stuff together and he's just great. He's he's that's the way his brain works. And his stuff is, I want to be outdoors. If if you tell him, hey, we're going to give you jo a job behind the desk, he'd be like, what? That would be the worst for him. He does construction as far as design. He, he's carpenter. There's a lot of carpentry work. And then I've got the other son who, real smart kid, real smart. Computers, writing, stuff like that. Totally different. Philosopher, that was one of his... Uh, one of his majors, he had a double, he got a double major, one in history and one in philosophy. You told him, Hey, I want you to build me something and be like, good luck on that. Um, but anyway, getting back to the philosophy things, you know, when I remember when he was going to school, um, you know, we would talk a lot, we would talk about the different schools of philosophy that he was studying. And some of these things is like, and you gotta really like this philosophy stuff to get into it. That's why I'm saying what he was talking about as far as wanting to know something and going in depth in studying it, you know, uh, whether it's the Greek philosophers or all the different uh, schools of philosophy that were out there around that time, you know, uh, stoicism, all these different things. Um, it's, it's, you got to really have a thirst for knowledge. How's that? All right. Because it doesn't, it doesn't sound like he did research light. It looks like he, he did research intensive. Um, and, and, and getting back to something that I was asking him, I think a lot of people think that when you try to put like a historically overlay over Jesus, you're robbing him of his divinity. I don't think so. And I know a lot of people in the church will say, well, like you're trying to, how, I don't know how to put this, overhumanize him. In other words, steal his divinity away from him when you just try to make him strictly a historical figure, I don't feel like that. I don't, I don't, I, I don't see the, how's this, the, um, the humanity, if you want to call it that, or I'm trying to think of the ordinary or being him an ordinary human doesn't steal or doesn't take away from his message. And really, that's what it is. It's what is the message. This is what David and, and, and me were talking about as far as, you know, where and in times where everything was war and conquest and subjugation, here you got this guy walking around saying, you know, love one another, turn the other cheek. Um, something totally different, like... Uh, 
talk of, talk about a a square peg in a round hole as at least as far as the times are concerned or the place or the place how's that because if you say well, okay well Jesus you know ended up being born in Tibet or some place like that he could have fit right on in you know with but no he was born in these times where because of the turmoil that was going on this this was this was something significant that colored everybody's life and I think a lot of us, I'm going to talk here in the United States, don't understand what it would be like to live uh, as a conquered people. You know, in other words, that, yeah, they're letting you live your life and you can practice your religion and you can come in. But at the end of the day, you've got armies stationed out there and you're expected to pay taxes and um, you can settle minor uh, legalities amongst yourself. But if it becomes any bigger than that, you got to go to the Roman people, you know, the head honcho guy to settle it, which kind of means, okay, children, you know, figure it out. But if it, you know, if not, I'm going to, don't, don't make me have to like intervene. You know, a lot of us don't understand what, it, what life would be like to live like that, uh, where uh, the culture or the people would be so anxious to throw off the yoke of the Romans and here comes Jesus running around, well, I'm, you know, with uh, spreading a philosophy of love thy neighbor. And they're like, what? Love thy what? <laughs> you know, we're, we're, we're trying to figure out a way to get these Romans out of here. And we're not going to do it by turning the other cheek. So, yeah. Uh, again, I, I don't think that um, his, uh, putting Jesus into a historical perspective diminishes from him. On the contrary, as to why he would do that, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go out on a limb here because, but I, I'm not a big believer in blood sacrifice. I'm not. I, I don't. I don't think that God, whether you want to think of it as a male, female, or you know whatever, the, the divine requires anything along those lines from anybody, especially humans, that blood thing that's like, mm -mm, that mm, something there doesn't add up as far as I'm concerned. No, nope. It's especially if you're making an offering to God, interpret it as you will for that word, um, to, to appease him, to gain his, forgiveness to gain his I don't care. God does not want sacrifice much less a blood sacrifice from us that's that's Marlene's that's Marlene's version of it you know that that Jesus might have been a product of his time and his culture his ethnicity as far as Jewish that they do have blood sacrifices that's a whole totally different thing but that no I don't see that being part of the the whole relationship between us ourselves as humans and the divine i don't there blood sacrifice sacrifice period doesn't enter into it at all at all and it makes you wonder like who who got who made who who came up with that bright idea suffering you know will bring you know that thing and i i'm catholic i don't know about this suffering will bring you closer to god no, I mean, people suffer. Don't, don't get me wrong. People suffer, but I'm going to put it in context as far as the way I understand it. I'm a mother. <clears throat> and I want to say as a love for a child, I want to say is one of the most powerful emotions I've felt as a human being. Unselfish. How's this? Like, I would never, ever want from one of my children even as an adult that they do give any, give me anything or sacrifice or on the contrary, on the contrary, if there was any way that I could spare them even as adults again from being hurt or disappointed or hurt physically or emotionally, you know, and I know this is, you know, and I'm pretty hands off with my kids because at some point they're adults, but I'm saying that I, my kids don't have to come around or, or that I would, I'm going to teach you a lesson, that kind of deal, which is kind of like what they do with God sometimes. If you want to look at it from like a parent-child 
type of relationship where you better do this or not do that to keep in good favor. How's this? That example that he gave where a bunch of these Jewish people got wiped out by another Jewish rabbi because basically they were going along with the um, with what the Romans were demanding of them, which was basically you're going to participate and not only give us taxes, but basically if they want to look at it, you're, I want to say worshiping or participating. How's that? Do you, got, do you really think God cares about that? Really? You don't think that God could say, I know maybe you willingly wouldn't do this, but you're, you're subjugated people right now. And I understand the circumstances. I mean, if I was a parent, oh, again, let's, I'm using this as, I would understand that. I would understand that totally. So when they put this thing of like that God is going to come down and punish you because you were, you know, going along with the Romans, come on. I'm sorry. I don't agree with that. I just don't agree with that. I don't think that God, the divine, whatever you want to call it, is on um, that plane and somewhere somewhere we lost it in translation about what our relationship is be as humans with the divine and what what that dynamic is you know that kind of deal anyway guys let me get off my soapbox don't forget to sign up for my newsletter if wherever you see the whether it's the video or the podcast version you know, like it, subscribe to my channel so you get notifications. Sign up for my newsletter at mppellister.com or miamigoschronicles.com. Uh, again, this is a place where you can find links to all the shows, podcasts. And if you, um, whatever your podcast platform is, that's the place where you're going to get all the information. So again, guys, thank you for being part of my audience. You are all wonderful. And I will be seeing you soon next week. Come back. Have some great guests. Take care.